Welcome everyone to the fourth talk of the online seminar series on behavioral trees in robotics. The seminar series is targeting the growing global community of researchers and roboticists interested in behavior trees, especially applied to robotics problem like planning, learning, and control. And with this series, you will have the opportunity to discuss and see talks from leading experts in this field from both academia and industry. I would like to stress that each talk will be recorded and uploaded on YouTube. So also if you ask a question to the speaker, that also will be recorded and uploaded. And today we are lucky to have Davide Faconti from Picnic Robotics giving his talk. If you are into behavior trees development, you probably already know him, but Davide worked in robotics for almost 20 years now, exploring multiple domains like uh, bipedal locomotion, humanoid robots, perception, manipulation, navigation, and system architecture. And in the ROS community, very well known to be uh, an active open source contributor. And since 2018, he has been the primary maintainer of the library behavior3.cpp. And today we'll talk about the version four. So I would like to uh, leave the floor to, to Davide for his talk and thank you. Perfect, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. So now I can skip this part. You've said it all. So that's wonderful. Um, first of all, uh, thanks uh, because actually this work uh, is the continuation of something that you started, Michele. So the Beer Tree Library uh, is an evolution of the open source project uh, you created, uh, uh, and I've been maintaining it, as you said, in the last years. Uh, you know, growing. Uh, uh, the community as much as they could, uh, the, the documentation uh, and the tooling. Okay, so let's let's talk about this. Uh, actually, this is independent data that I found in a recent in a recent uh, publication that discuss how different uh, libraries uh, are adopted in the open source robotic uh, community. This is data scrapped from GitHub. Um, so you can see that BehavioreTree.cpp is getting uh, a lot of adoption. Uh, there are other solutions uh, that use uh, uh, final state machines that are still very strong, less like Mac uh, with CH uh, uh, that was created uh, more than one decade ago. And uh, what I always I like about uh, this particular implementation of uh, behavior trees is that uh, uh, first of all, he has a strong separation uh, between uh, the code that is uh, that you use to implement a node of the tree and the composition of the tree uh, uh, in terms of uh, putting nodes together that is done in XML. Actually, I could have used any other scripted language, but the XML served me well. This is really important because uh, for example, I've seen uh, in companies uh, PyTree is used that is a great library, but because it's Python and everything can be actually in the same uh, um, file, uh, people couldn't really follow best practices into separating what is uh, the node implementation from the tree composition. So I think that one of the added value of uh, behavior tree CPP is this strong separation um then uh, there's a lot of tooling uh there's a visual uh, graphic user interface uh, called Groot uh, that you can use to edit uh, or debug in real time uh, your behavior trees and also a very strategic decision was to don't uh, um, use any specific uh, framework or middleware like for example ross uh, or yarp uh, or whatever uh, so the really the core of the library is dependent from any big uh, framework. Um, so this means that also is more flexible to you know to, to be used in a, in a broader range, uh, even if probably the ROS community is the biggest one. Uh, I, that that's something that I started in, including in my presentation when I talk about uh, uh, behavior trees because. Uh, uh, it really summarized the way I think about uh, software development in general and how I applied these uh, ideas to uh, behavior tree CPP in particular. So I, I love these images. This is a representation of Plato and Aristotle talking uh, to each other and actually, uh, uh, you know, having gestures about uh, 
uh, their own uh, philosophy. So we have the idealism of, of, of Plato, the Platonic ideas, um, and then the realism of Aristotle. And this translated in uh, software development means that we need to think both about the big ideas, uh, about uh, composability, uh, hierarchical composition, uh, reactivity, modularity. These are all concepts that are really important when we analyze uh, a software as behavior trees uh, uh, where the grammar, the semantic of what we are doing is really important. Uh, but there is also the, uh, let's say, the more real and pragmatic part. There is something that uh, I think was really important to make this particular library popular. That is the focus on uh, the quality of the code, uh, the usability, the documentation, and a lot of uh, dialogue with users. So a lot of uh, interviews with companies and single users to understand their struggle, to understand what I can do better. So I've seen a lot, a lot of uh, very smart people not spending enough time, uh, you know, with the real users. And uh, and you know creating a beautiful piece of of, of software that then nobody used. I, I don't want that to happen to this project. So I'm going to jump right into what motivated the, the new big version of uh, 4.0 of this library. Um, I'm using this joke for that. Uh, so. One of the premises of behavior trees is that we are going to free you from the nightmare of states. So state machines are complex, uh, and we have uh, uh, you know our own narrative to describe uh, what we believe is better in behavior trees, and that's that's perfect. That's right, uh, and and I think that we are demonstrating more and more in practice how this change is positive and how we can improve scalability. But I also believe that in this narrative, sometimes uh, we forget to mention that uh, if I ask a person to draw a behavior on a napkin, so let's say that uh, I say, hey, explain to me what are the, what is the logic of your robot. So you take a napkin and a pen, and you will probably start drawing something that resemble a state flow. I'm pretty sure this will be what happened nine out of 10 times. You will not use a behavior tree. And, and the reason for that is that uh, I think that we still think somehow in terms of state, this is more natural for us. And uh, trying to convince people that everybody is wrong and you are right is not the best way to get adoption. Uh, the best way is really to understand, uh, okay, if you struggle to map your mental model of the problem into people trees, what can I do to make your life easier? Instead of uh, asking you to change your mind, maybe I should change the way I, I build my tools. So this is this is really what I what I call the being you know humble and empathic with with the user. Not uh, understand that uh, maybe there's nothing wrong about you as a user. Maybe there's something wrong about me as as a to, you know tool developer. And uh, I'm going to take this example. Uh, this is from one video of uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, this is, I, th I think the title was uh, why memory nodes are a bad idea. So uh, the proposed solution for reactive behavior is this one that use uh, states uh, uh, stored in the blackboard. Because uh, if we look at it, uh, we see that we have some condition that are probably nothing more than reading uh, into a state that could be the blackboard or somewhere else. And, uh, and then take a certain branch of the tree if that condition is true or false. So something that I, I miss here is, uh, I don't know where A visited is set to true, and I don't know where, it's, where the variable is cleaned up. So this already looks to me kind of uh, correct, 
and maybe easy to read, but a little bit cumbersome when I think about uh, having this in my screen and trying to read that this. So the real estate used is definitely a lot. So, and there's some information still missing to have this really expressing of what is going on. Um, and these are states. So, right, we cannot really say, oh, forget about states, when in reality, we are using them to create reactive behaviors. So if we are using states, let's make it that easier, not harder. That's, that's the premise of, of the new version of the library. Um, so that's that's the biggest change in uh, version 4.0. The goal is to improve the productivity, uh, the readability of the behavior trees. Oh, there's a typo there. Sorry about that. And uh, reduce the cognitive overhead. Um, so the effort, the mental effort to, to actually write and read the, the behavior trees. And the way I think uh, I, I can achieve those goals is actually making uh, the definition and the use of states uh, more idiomatic and simple. So to solve this problem, uh, uh, there's a scripting language that has been added on top of behavior trees on the XML side. So this is really important because no change need to be done on the C++ part. And actually, you will probably need to write less CPP code. So if I go back to the previous example, you know, those uh, safe from fire or A visited or B visited uh, are those piece of C++ code, should I write one in a inherited class for each of them? That, that seems like a lot of work. Of course, there are the solution to this problem, but let's, as I said, I like to, to do that in a more idiomatic and fast way. So I created this scripting language that is very, very simple, but very powerful in the cost context of behavior trees, where we have uh, um, Assignment operators, so this is in the first line. So you can assign to a variable, either a number or a, a string, or you can even use enums uh, for readability. So there are still numbers, but they look you know, like enums. You, you represent them as a string. Um, so we are assigning values uh, to elements of the blackboard. Those are my variables then you can see that I can compare them and say, okay, if these two variables are the same or if uh, error code is equal to a certain number. So the, the classical, um, let's say, logic operators, uh, uh, then you can also do arithmetics. Uh, so instead, of, yes, sometimes you want and and uh, also comparison uh, like uh, less than uh, uh, greater than, oh, here there is an example with the uh, if then else. Uh, uh, so target will take a different uh, value based on the fact that this uh, voltage is less than 10 or not. Um, and that's it. That's it uh, in, a, in a very short description of what, what you can do the, with this scripting language. But I, I'm going to show you some examples that uh, demonstrate how your tree can become much more readable using them. Um, let's take this example. So I've seen this many, many times uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, when I talk with users uh, and, you know, there are companies that come to me and say, hey, David, give me your opinion about this. And I've seen that they always have at the beginning, uh, you know, a big uh, branch or subtree that they use to initialize the variables. So you don't need to do it in C++. There is a, a spe, uh, special node in, uh, in my library that is set blackboard, where you specify the name of the, of the entry and the value you want to assign. Uh, now on the right side, you can see that you can do exactly the same, but in a much more compact and readable way. So, uh, multiple commands separated by semicolon. So simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, 
but that's that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let's look at this um, decorator I also have. So on the left side, uh, I had some decorators that because of the fact that uh, uh, behavior tree CPP is uh, um, strongly typed, I need to have a check int, check uh, double, check string. So basically what I do on the left is say, okay, let's take two values. One could be a constant uh, uh, and the other, uh, the, the name of the entry of the blackboard. And if they are equal, then execute my child or return failure. Um, or you can compare, for example, two entries. Uh, now on the right side, uh, not only this is more readable and straightforward, but also you have uh, arithmetic operators. So you have, uh, um, you know, not just the equality operator, but also you can say more uh, greater than or less than. And it just looks better. I think this just looks more readable, more straightforward than like real code. There's no mental gap uh, between what I expect when I read code. Uh, compared to the left side, uh, that requires a little bit more thinking. Um, so the way you express this uh, in your code, uh, as I said, is done uh, entirely in XML. So you don't need to write C++ code. You don't need to do a lot of boilerplate uh, to inherit it from a base class, uh, compile, add it to your CMake list. Uh, so all these things can be done directly in the XML definition. And also, uh, and you can do it, you can um, add the scripts also to create what I call pre and post conditions. Uh, this means that uh, uh, we can have scripts ex executed before the actual implementation of a node or after that node returned the value. So like success or failure. Um, and here there's an example. So there's an emergency landing. I guess this uh, would be a drone. And uh, if the voltage that uh, I guess it's, it's a value that has been updated somewhere else uh, uh, is below a certain threshold, then you do execute this, uh, uh, this node. Otherwise, you skip it. And uh, if the node returns success or when the node returns success, if this is an asynchronous uh, uh, as it should be uh, action, then uh, you can change your global state to land it. And there will be for sure other branches of the tree that uh, are only executed where you, you are in the landed state or in the takeoff state or the on mission state. So now it is much, much easier to have this, you know, to, to have dedicated branches that are um, executed only when, when you are in a particular state. And, and I think this is a very good example of how you can improve the readability. So here, there's, there's a, an old example I had uh, in my tutorials where I want a certain value of the black border to be set uh, to, to either zero or one or minus one based on the result of move base. So if you look at that, we have the case when move base is successful, then you set the black the result to zero, or you need to take into account when that fails with a fallback or selector as it's called sometimes. And then you need to remember that also you need to force failure because because uh, you know uh, since move base base uh, failed uh, you want to return a failure. So you see, not rocket science, but a little bit annoying and you know not straightforward. And if you look now on what we have on the right side uh, using uh, two post conditions on success and on failure, I can say not only can say, set that uh, you know in a very readable way, but also I can use enums. So instead of saying zero or minus, minus one, I can associate some enums to that uh, to improve readability. 
And then, of course, uh, what I expect is that based on the value of the result, there will be another portion of the tree that either takes some recovery actions or don't. So if, if now I come back to the original uh, uh, example I, I mentioned earlier, this is the way you would express it uh, with, a, with a pre and post condition. So basically the first, the very first go-to uh, that is uh, where, where we're using the same uh, implementation with different parameters. So go to post A, B, or C. So the, the go to A uh, is only taken uh, if the variable uh, visited the A is false. So probably it's, it's a little, this, the font is a little bit small, but there is a exclamation point uh, uh, there. And, um, and then we set this variable to true on success. So you, you see, we already sold something that uh, was not clear to me when I looked at this example, that is, okay, would turn A visited to true. Where, where is that? I don't see it. I mean, my guess is that go to A in the original example was setting A visited to true. But, uh, you know, that's not super visible. It's just a guess. I don't really see it when I look at the tree. Now, instead, it's very explicit. Uh, then, uh, I do the same for visited B. And then in C, I don't even need the C variable because actually what I'm doing once this is completed is to clean up everything. And that is also something that I missed in the original example where I said, okay, yeah, but where do I clean these variables? I have no idea. Is it in another portion of the tree? Is it here? So now it is, it's clear that once go to C is done, I can clean up uh, all my flags uh, so that uh, I can maybe, because maybe I want to repeat this, this whole sequence again uh, later on. Now in more detail, these are the four preconditions currently implemented. Uh, there is a, a skip if, uh, that means uh, if the condition is true, then uh, uh, do not execute this child. And from the point of view of the parent, uh, pretend that child doesn't exist. That's really important because if I say, oh yeah, return success, that would be like a skip if it's a sequence, uh, but it would have a, a different uh, meaning uh, if it's a selector. So you see that uh, if you want to skip uh, a child in a sequence, you need to return a success. If you want to skip uh, a child in a fallback uh, or selector, you need to return failure. Instead, uh, this is a new semantic where I say, yeah, whatever, whatever is your logic parent, uh, please uh, ignore me. Uh, pretend that I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm not there. Then there is the more explicit uh, success and failure if, uh, where instead say no, not only skip uh, the execution of this node, uh, but also return explicitly success or failure. And then there is the reactive version of it. Uh, that is, uh, if you have uh, uh, a node in the running state uh, that is common in the behavior tree CPP where uh, each asynchronous operation uh, will return running, then if at any point uh, during the running state, uh, this condition become false, uh, then send an abort uh, and interrupt the, uh, the execution. And this is something that uh, originally uh, it is implemented as a reactive sequence uh, in the library. And now it is, uh, it is uh, I think, more compact and powerful. But, but basically, it's very, very similar to the way 90% of the people were using uh, reactive sequence with a condition that it was checked continuously and then an asynchronous operation that could be aborted if that condition becomes false. So once again, uh, less node uh, on your screen, uh, more straightforward uh, uh, implementation. Then post conditions, uh, we have on success, on failure, that is basically the script invoked uh, when those particular results are returned. And on halted, this is something new because right, you know, with the previous version of the library, 
I didn't really have a mechanism to react differently um, when when the node is halted. So now now I can. And then there is the post that simply, no matter what the result was, either success or, or failure, then always execute this code. Um, so this more or less should cover all the possible cases. And of course, uh, these new concepts uh, are have been introduced recently. So I'm looking forward for the community saying, uh, hey, I will need a fifth <laughs> or sixth uh, uh option here so you know i think this is a very good start that will cover 90 percent of the of the use cases but uh, i'm open to you know to listen to what the users say and maybe this list uh, may grow um to learn more there's a new website uh, uh with a lot of tutorials uh, uh there's also a migration guide uh, if you're already using a uh, uh, version 3.x uh, um and you know, I hope that that uh, the amount of information on this website will grow based on uh, maybe uh, the description of a specific uh, design pattern or use cases. Uh, I would really love uh, to have a section about the success stories. Uh, so people and company, uh, people and companies uh, using uh, the library in real world uh, scenarios, uh, and and you know interviewing uh, those people and uh, having uh, short articles about them. So what's next? Um, I'm currently working on a new version of Groot that is the graphic user interface for uh, behavior trees. Uh, the, the old version uh, didn't <laughs> age uh, well. Uh, so I'm working really hard uh, on you know, developing the second one. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, the new features. And um, I, I'm looking forward to get feedback from the community to learn from them uh, uh, what they think uh, if these new features help them to create more expressive uh, behaviors. And as I said, uh, uh, we really love to collect, uh, you know, maybe a, a small library of design patterns and typical use cases that people can refer to when they create their trees. Because uh, we know that there are multiple ways to, to solve the same problem. And sometimes uh, you may identify uh, the most, uh, you know, the best one among all these X possible solution. And you want this to become part of the idiomatic use of behavior trees. And that's it. So any, any question from, our big audience. <laughs> How many are we? Just four of us. Twenty-three now. Twenty-three. Oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, David, for this awesome talk. Uh, I ask the people that want to ask question to raise the hand, the virtual hand in Zoom. So I can then move the floor. And I'm just checking. Uh, you can also ask a question in the chat, and we then read it out loud. While we wait for the first question, David, uh, in group 2.0, we will have the uh, the script node where you can write directly the script. Correct, uh, correct. That, that is uh, one. Uh, so one, one of the most visible changes that uh, the first group expect uh, one massive XML where you have all the trees, the main tree and sub trees that can grow fast. Now there is a, a different workflow focused on multi files. So the idea that you can have, uh, you know, as you expect from from a programming language, you want uh, you don't want a, a giant. Uh, oh, Razan, you're online. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing the link. Uh, I, you know, that now I'm I'm sharing that uh, screenshot in uh, uh, in all my presentation. Thanks for your work. Um, sorry, I've seen that there is a link in the chat box uh, uh, from the author of uh, that publication. Um, so, as I said, uh, so Groot will have this, uh, this uh, pre and post condition, uh, and we'll have uh, uh, multi file XML, and also 
the real-time monitoring will be greatly improved uh, with breakpoints, uh, visualization of the blackboard, uh, and other nice stuff like that. Yeah, also the visualization of the blackboard is something that I'm yeah, dreaming about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will the floor to the audience for questions. Can see one hand lifted. Yes, please go ahead. <clears throat> one, sorry, one, two, three. Um, yeah, I hope you can me. hear me. You definitely yes. cannot see me. So maybe I'll just cut the video instead. Um, yes, I, I had a, a couple of connected questions. Um, my my first question i was wondering if you feel because i can see that you introduce uh, bits of scripting which you add to the xml but i was wondering uh, and, it, and it's almost a question to everybody if you feel comfortable with uh, always writing the behavior trees as xml rather than uh, and my question comes from the fact that i uh, i have always written my behavior trees in in code instead of using mm -hmm. the xml so I'm trying to understand if you can, would consider. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. I don't know if my answer is is valid because because I'm biased. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll I'll tell you that that was my experience with the pie trees. So the the problem is that uh, and that was in a company, you not know, not in academia. So they had uh, you know to understand the structure of of uh, the tree. I needed to open ten different files and look at the code. There was no introspection, or I could have introspection only if I run the code, but not during the writing or the reading. So that was the reason why I wanted the scripting language. That and, and XML was just a lazy solution to that. Uh, but I don't want it to C++ because otherwise, if you think about it, there's no way I can use a graphic editor. Because if I use a graphic editor, how can I generate C++? I could generate C++ code, and then I need to compile it, but it's not as direct as having a text format of the tree and using that to parameterize and, and compose the tree. So I have the very, very strong opinion that this is the best way to do it and that any library, even if, in state machine that obliged me to compile the structure of the logic is not good for productivity. So that, that is a very strong and opinionated, uh, you know, decision. I think I understand. So what you what you're saying is you find value in the in the XML presentation um, because it can be visualized. Whereas and, and edited, yes. So so it is it is uh, I can have it in a single location and not spread about uh, many files. I can modify that uh, in uh, you know uh, on an editor and don't recompile. So I don't love XML, but it's uh, you know it's less bad. That I've tried uh, to represent it in JSON or YAML and it looks even worse. So because oh, of the okay. parameters, so, you know, I don't love it, but, uh, but uh, you know, using a standard uh, representation uh, is what, what, what makes more sense for me. I, I understand. So to, just for context, uh, I was especially interested, looking forward to your talk, really, uh, because in, I believe in the past uh, two months and a half, uh, I switched my system to a domain specific language. So. The separation is the same in that, of course, the behavior tree stays completely outside the host language. Uh, but but I, I choose the, I would say, the perhaps hardworking solution of, of writing a, a specific language. Uh, so, so I think this part I kind of understand. And, and my other question was, does, does the, the library behavior tree CPP, uh, mm -hmm. does it support parameterization? Can, can you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So actually, in the, in the the way we we parameterize, uh, uh, you know, each action is through what we call ports. That actually is nothing but a wrapper around this concept of the blackboard. 
uh, an improved, I would say an improved uh, uh, version of Blackboard. And, uh, and you know, they have input and output. So a, param a parameter is an input. And also there is this data flow. So the output, so the outcome of an action like a detect object could be the input of another action that is grasp object. So, so, the, so the library introduced this uh, concept of data flow that can be used, uh, as I said, to pass information from one node to the other or to parameterize a node. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, but I think it would be best that, uh, that mm -hmm. I look at, at the actual library. Yes. Um, yeah. oh, hopefully the tutorials explain this very, <laughs> hopefully very well. So, so there's probably the second tutorial that already explored this concept of uh, data ports for parameterization. Yes, so th thank you very much. <laughs> I will add my two cents here. I also like the XML solution for designing BTs. I used to write C code, C plus plus code for doing the BT, and then uh, I switched to uh, editing XML. It's just <laughs> and and actually, let me add something. I mean, the original project that financed the, my my work in Biblia Tree was about model driven development in robotics. That's not a coincidence. So there is a so the idea of model driven development is that uh, you have a sufficiently uh, explicit uh, representation of the model that is enough to understand what's going on, but the actual implementation in terms of uh, your language is uh, completely opaque. So you don't you don't need to know you don't need to know what is happening under the hood because the amount of information that is exposed. Uh, is sufficient for you to understand it. That's why I was bothered by this example of a go to A setting, uh, setting the variable A visited, because that is something that I'm guessing, but I don't really know when I look at the model. So that is something that the model, when I look at the tree, tree as model of, of the behavior, I don't really see, I don't, I don't know where this variable is, is changed. Instead, with the behavior tree CPP, I'm exposing uh, sufficient information to the user to, to have that kind of uh, understanding about what's going on in terms of data flow between nodes. So the, the design decisions I have are all about not having this information hidden, but visible, not as C++, but as model, and the XML is something that I can read from a graphic user interface. So reading raw XML is not the most pleasant experience uh, you can have, but you can load that in the graphic user interface and have a much nicer representation. Absolutely, and I, I just, sorry, I just wanted to say before I uh, leave the space for the next question that, um, that yeah, I'm very interested in, in, um, in figuring how much because at the same time, for your scripting language, uh, you, you allow some state. So there is an acknowledgement that some state uh, should be part of a model. And uh, uh, in, in the industry I operate, uh, we're still at the stage where we're really trying to explain to people that uh, overusing state and, and combining everything can be dangerous. However, I, to I totally understand how you may want some state to be part of a model here. So I found this super interesting. Yeah, actually, I think that this is the result of years working with uh, with companies and understanding, uh, you know, where they were struggling. So it's kind of, uh, as, you know, we did uh, <laughs> we did five step forward, uh, and then we realized that we had to take one backward uh, in terms of uh, you know making states uh, something that. Uh, you're not, you know, there is simpler than a finite state machine, but it's something that you can still reason about uh, simply where, for example, you have a big uh, uh, macro state like uh, the drone uh, landing, uh, taking off, uh, 
or delivering a package or whatever, those are macro states and having those exposed allow you to, to or make your trees and sub trees more, you know, separated. Okay. Uh, oh, we have okay, thank one you. from Razan. Thank you so much. And thank you, Davida, for the interesting presentation. And if I may say before I ask my question here, which is more about your opinion about something, is I like the changes you've done since I did like some analysis for behavior tree uh, model in different implementations. To be honest, uh, yeah, checking the XML was really <laughs> helpful to do. And even with the whole, uh, you can check it with the group. It was really easy and really helpful to do the separation that you don't need the actual working environment for robotic to check the models for debugging or whatever like uh, so yeah and the new like improvement you've done i really like them i think they might make it easier for one even to understand the models so yeah my question here actually is more of uh, asking you about an opinion that because you were talking about the xml and how you prefer it uh uh for like for the users although it's not the best but uh it's better than going through the different files because with my analysis i've noticed something with the more like flex b for example for state mm -hmm. machine they use auto generation like to reduce uh, so you have the graphical interface where you build your model and then you do some auto generation of the code maybe i would like here to hear more your opinion about sure. that approach because both are different model <laughs> different I... approaches but just want to hear uh, mm -hmm. what's your thought here why you prefer that way then maybe oh that, that, yeah. there's a great uh, there's a great uh, question because uh, i really really think that code generation is an anti pattern so i you know there is a factory pattern. So in programming, uh, we know how to do a factory. So, you know, instantiating, uh, instantiating uh, at runtime, uh, a certain, a uh, uh, certain instance of a class and then connect them is something that is trivial. So it's so much powerful to do this uh, at deployment time. So when you start the application you read the file and you instantiate, you get exactly the same advantage uh, and you don't lose anything. So when you do code generation, then you still have uh, the step of compiling. Uh, and then if you change something uh, in your tree, you need to recompile. I see absolutely no technical or philosophical reason to do that because uh, uh, basically there's no drawback. And the speed of your application is going to be the same because that is done only once at the beginning. Uh, so you just lose flexibility and add one more step to your process. So I have uh, the strong, strong opinion that a lot of applications that use code generation in model-driven development uh, shouldn't. Um, the only advantage you may have is that uh, you know you have some less call to to some strings. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, that uh, you know I really don't like code generation because just not because I don't like it, because I don't see any use for it in practice. Yeah, I mean, it depends. We cannot satisfy all the users, but it might be if you're targeting people who you don't want them to write a lot of code, maybe someone who are more not that experienced, it could be a way, but also with the way you provide it also, it's what you have a point, it's either you want a deployment, time faster or the other way when you make it less coding for people so yeah but uh, and and but uh, and really the point is that you're not really losing anything i mean uh, the approach i have uh, that does it at deployment time uh, at runtime uh, only at the beginning there's really no compromise there in terms of uh, of speed you know maybe we're losing uh, 10 milliseconds uh, when you launch the program so what's what's the problem with that but at runtime during the execution, there's no penalty. So generated code is not more efficient. Yeah, but thank you. Um, just wanted to hear your opinion about that because here's the funny thing. <laughs> one of the, not improvements, but one of the suggestions is maybe considering that in the paper. So just wanna hear uh, your opinion about mm -hmm. that. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
and, and actually I would love to get in touch to anybody and say, no, David, I really need cogeneration. Uh, please get in touch and tell me because <laughs> I haven't seen so, so, such a case in practice. But I'd, I'd love to learn. Okay, thank you all for your questions. Is there any last question you want to ask? Okay, if not, I would like to thank you again, Davide, for this awesome presentation and for his time to, to chat with us. And thank you for all of you uh, for uh, joining and asking questions and uh, joining the, the live presentation. As I said, this will be also uh, recorded, so uh, you can also re-watch the, the video after that. I will, I will send a link of the recorded video through the, uh, the various social uh, that I advertise the, uh, the, the talk. So thank you again to all of you people, both David and the, uh, the, uh, the people that are attending. And we'll see you next time with the next speaker. And thank you. Bye-bye.